Before we jump into this episode, I want to remind you that while Caitlin and Sophia are dietitians, we're not your dietitians. This means the information shared in the Food Freedom Fertility podcast is intended to entertain, educate, and inform. It is not a substitute for medical care. This information is not intended to diagnose, manage, or treat disease. Always consult with your doctor before making any changes. Welcome to another episode of Food Freedom and Fertility. We are your hosts, Sophia Pivia and Caitlin Johnson, both registered dietitian nutritionists, both specializing in women's fertility and hormonal health, Caitlin being the PCOS specialist, me being the progesterone specialist, and today we have another very special specialist. How many <laughs> times can I say special? Uh, Dr. Naomi Whitaker is here with us today. So this is her second time coming on the show. So if you are a longtime listener, this will be a familiar voice for you. But Dr. Whitaker is an OBGYN. She is a board certified gynecological surgeon. She also practices natural procreative medicine, and she is our go-to expert on all things, not dietitian things. (laughs) She is our, our doctor of choice. She is just wonderful. So we are really happy to have her on the show today. And um, we are going to be talking about something that your doctor may not have told you is an option. And that are, that is, is our, I don't know what, treatments for fallopian tube problems. Do you have a block tube? Do you have a tube that's sort of like refluxing and pushing things the wrong direction? Do you have adhesions? Do you have infections? Do we not even really know what the problem is according to the conventional testing that you've had done? Dr. Whitaker is here to talk about how to get your tubes healthy and uh, just to shed some light on some options you might not have been told about by your own doctor. So welcome Dr. Whitaker or Naomi, we'll probably interchange the two. We're just very thankful that you're giving us this time for us and our listeners. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction. And I'm just so honored to be here with you both. And you're just incredible at what you do. And I've seen the results with patients, so. Yeah, we have had a lot of overlap, you and I, lately. We have had patients kind of bouncing back and forth between the two of us, and it has been really fun. I love it. I love... I do, too. uh, I love working with you, even though we've never... (laughs) You're the only one. You're meeting these people in person. Most of my patients, I've never even met them in person, which is doing everything virtually, but... We've yet to do figure out how to do surgery virtually, though I think that that is probably on the near horizon. Probably. Wild. Scary wow. and cool. <laughs> and here we are so to here another are. episode. Dr. Naomi, people may not have listened to our previous episode, which the number is not on the top of my head, but we talked a lot about NAPRO and what it is and what it isn't. But can you give us a little bit of a refresher of like, if somebody yeah, is- Yeah, NAPRO or NAPRO or like help us not sound, I know yeah, Caitlin I mean... and I are each saying it differently and one of us has gotta be wrong. And <laughs> so I wanna figure this out. Well, it's same for natural procreative technology. So since it's NAP, I say no, NAPRO technology. Okay. I'm an old dog and I won't learn new tricks. And so I'll probably say it wrong all episode. But what is it? And what is it not? Yeah, it's treating the underlying issue, women's health issues with, with modern medicine, with advances of medicine. And so it's basically what reproductive medicine was, was turning into until IVF was developed and all advancement basically stopped outside of IVF. If you look at the studies, mainly um, they focus on for fertility research, it's all IVF, you know, does this improve IVF outcomes instead of, okay, what about this other option? Uh, For example, tubal surgery. So I was reading literature on um, a very, very specific tubal disease that's very rare. And uh, it said, in the comment section, you know, they put their opinion in this article and it said, um, is tubal surgery obsolete? So should we even be 
thinking or considering or doing tubal surgery anymore. And I think that's ridiculous. But that's where the literature is. That was published in a mainstream source yeah. to even consider. Is this when the data is very robust as far as the um, the success is higher than IVF for tubal mm -hmm. surgery. And so, um, for example, so uh, for nap NAPRO technology, if there's a tubal obstruction, we would unblock the tube instead of going to IVF. So if you could mm -hmm. summarize kind of NAPRO. Um, and so it's, it's um, working cooperatively with a woman's body to achieve natural pregnancy or optimize women's health issues such as PMS, painful periods, PCOS. And so we do use medications and we may be more likely to also introduce supplements, bioidentical hormones, those kind of approaches instead of suppressive therapies like IVF or birth control. Wow. Well, we actually had um, someone on the show, maybe this would even be the episode airing right before you, a doctor, or he's not a doctor, but Larry Werner, uh, who does body work for women who are struggling to conceive, releasing adhesions, and he has a whole protocol, and it's very successful, at, but he was even speaking of how it's been very challenging to get physicians to want to even do this so they say well this is obsolete because we can just do ivf and you know opening a block tube like we we already have a treatment for that and it's called ivf mm -hmm. and so right. we don't need why we don't need to, to research do this. yeah why? or why even offer this to our patients when it's going to cut into everything that we're doing here everything we're investing in as, as a clinic it's going to i don't want to use the word undermine but it's going to maybe not it's not going to generate profit. It's slower as far as like, you don't see results like that immediately. Anyway, it just, uh, he was coming up against it and saying that doctors that were initially very excited because they obviously want to help people and they got into this industry because they love families and they love women and they want to see this happen. Uh, can be resistant to things that make IVF, I don't want to say obsolete, but they are a workaround for someone that doesn't want to do that. And uh, I, he was talking about that same thing. And, and we were like, when the doctor that he was speaking about came back to him and said, you know, we're actually not going to research this because we already have a cure, you know, quote unquote, for block tubes. And that's and IVF. Yeah. We were like, did you th smack her like did, did you punch her in her fallopian tube did you did you at least <laughs> splash a cup of water in her face <laughs> dr Me, naomi i see what you're talking about you kind of answered the question about what napro is can you speak a little bit to like the character or the belief system that also is intertwined with why it is what it is and why it is what it is not just for listeners that might not be familiar with it sure can i add one more a couple things yeah. to what Please, Sophia yeah. said because there's so many things when you say anything little like that it just it opens up because this so is much really a, pa seen. a passion it's, of yours it, yeah and and that's just a big problem i mean that summarizes the, some of the problems with women's health care they get tunnel vision you just do birth control you just do ivf and that's it I and mean, what about people with cultural financial medical barriers to ivf I mean, we what talked about, about the risk to your body. What about the risk to the baby? Right. I mean, you know, as, as a provider also who provides, you know, comprehensive OBGYN care, delivers babies. When a woman walks in the door as an IVF pregnancy, we automatically, we just know she's high risk. I mean, we, we watch her so carefully. We're very nervous the whole pregnancy because things do go wrong. I've seen the worst things often happen to women who've gone through IVF after years of of trauma and infertility, they have more trauma. Um, and they don't, you know, the IVF physicians don't talk to you about, and they don't do the deliveries either. So they don't, that's not on their mind. You know, when, when I help my patients conceive, I'm also often responsible for their whole pregnancy and delivery. So it's, you want to see what's in your, your doctor's perspective, what's in their best interest. I talk to patients about this all the time. When you go see different opinions, you know, do they just want you for three cycles and then it's all or nothing with IVF? It's pretty, pretty straightforward from the doctor's perspective, you know, 
you, you, you pay for those cycles, you get it. Um, and then you move on and that's what they see. But for me, I want to see them have a healthy pregnancy because I'm ultimately responsible for that whole pregnancy. It makes my job easier when they have a nice, healthy pregnancy, a term, healthy baby, not just a live baby. And there's a big difference that they don't talk to you about Mm -hmm. when they talk about. So that's a huge um, criticism I've received as well. I've changed institutions recently and, and, you know, so new perspectives and new comments of other physicians and they ask, well, why don't you just do IVF? Why don't you just refer for IVF? And I think that's a really insensitive comment. It's just not the right treatment for everyone. Like yeah. uh, it's almost like heart transplants. Let, let, let's imagine that we came up with a technology that let us grow a human heart um, and we didn't need to transplant it from someone else. And then medical care shifted. We're not even doing statin drugs anymore. We're not doing any bypasses. We're not doing any balloon angioplasties. We're not doing any heart treatments because we can just do a heart transplant. And look at this, your heart issues are cured because of your heart transplant. And that's great, but what about the risks? What about the fact that you're gonna have to be on anti-rejection drugs for the rest of your life? What about the fact that you're gonna have to have open heart surgery and be cut open in order to do this? Like, it, it, it would be so wonderful if we, anyone who needed a heart transplant could just have one. That would be a, just a miracle in the medical world. But if all of healthcare shifted to where that becomes the, the button the answer, standard. Mm-hmm. that becomes the standard. And these more low risk, let's at least try this first, procedures, treatments, medications, therapies, just get, just fall by the wayside, then what are we what are we doing to patients it's an extreme amount of risk in open heart surgery a heart transplant lifelong complications and risk that are completely worth it if you have like a, a extreme case where a new heart is absolutely needed there's heart defects that are incurable but to say that that's what everybody's going to do now that is sort of like the way that i see ivf going that it's this thing that can bypass a lot of issues. So it starts to become an, the only answer. So, yeah, I think that's one example, but there are limitations to that example that you give because a woman won't die without IVF with a heart oh, transplant. Yeah, that's you, very would. True. you know, so mm-hmm. that's a very different thing. So what we're talking about is something totally elective. Um, and I mean, obviously infertility is absolutely life shattering. Um, but someone won't die. So, um, yeah, and you're when, right. And the di- and also another difference is when when I see patients, you know, women with infertility will sometimes spiral. I mean, that's it's such a tragic thing to go through. That's what naturally happens without extreme support, you know, emotional uh, and, and and religious, you know, different aspects of support. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So what I see in the downward spiral of some women, um, if they they don't have something to hold on to, to keep them from falling, um, I see that they are willing to put their body in danger for their goal instead of like what I do. Anything we do should also be helping your health. And so once you start putting your body at risk of compromise and potentially increased risk of death when you're healthy, I think there's something... um, you know, very concerning about that. And I think there's bigger issues at risk, you know, that that's exposing. Um, and I hope that family can, and can help, you know, a spouse say, Hey, honey, like, I love you for who you are. You know, let's, let's appreciate what we have right now. Let's re reset and see where we're going to go here because I see that spiral happen. And, and before you get really deep into therapy, into treatments for fertility or anything, you know, same goes with me in in practicing medicine. Before I jumped into the water of practicing as medicine, you know, medicine as a physician, I had to step back and think, where am I going to draw the line before I'm in? Because once you're in the water and you're, you're trying to swim and keep your head above the water in medical training or in uh, fertility treatments, you can't see clearly anymore. And so to draw that line ahead of time, like why, and know why, um, you know, whether I see patients come to me all the time. Okay. I drew the line after IUI for this reason. And I didn't want to be pushed to IVF and they'll tell me these stories. Um, 
you know, at these clinics and, and, and where their line was and why, and it's really interesting. Um, but I just think that's a really important, you know, when we're talking, especially about the tube topic, because that's where women who are facing tubal issues, you know, am I going to pursue IVF? Um, am I going to look for alternative treatments or am I going to pursue like adoption? You know, that's, they're at this mm-hmm, crossroads. Mm-hmm. And so I yeah. think that's a really important part of the discussion um, when we talk about tube issues and, and to be honest with yourself and why, um, and when you go to that point of desperate, you know, kind of desperation or, or not thinking clearly, um, you can really get yourself into, um, you know, trouble. And what mother wouldn't? You know, like I, I so relate to that because for the life of your child, for the health of your child, for the safety of your child, what mother would not sacrifice her own body for that? And so it, it's it's a very – it comes from a place of intense love, that yeah. protection, motherly instinct. It's a good thing that that's where your brain and your heart wants to go. We just want to steward that wisely because it is very a very powerful drive within a mother. Yeah, it's an instinct. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have to really also, though, be aware and, and very um, – I don't know what's the word, but – circumspect Con- conscious about you know why too we're taking a quick break from this episode to talk about one of our sponsors the prenatal nutrition library we love the prenatal nutrition library it's a searchable database and app which means you have answers within seconds and peace of mind that what you're eating during pregnancy is both safe and nutritious it's almost like having your own personal pregnancy dietitian in your back pocket that's going to not only tell you, is it safe to eat this, how much of that should I have, yada, 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 but give you actual meal plans so you know how to put it all together onto your plate today. And the meal plans are trimester specific, meaning you know some women are kind of nauseous in their first trimester and maybe they need specific foods to help combat that. Prenatal Nutrition Library has got you covered. Or the fact that your baby's brain is growing rapidly in your third trimester and you need your nutrition to support that. Prenatal Nutrition Library Meal Plans has got you covered there too. This is evidence-based information. Registered dietitians are in this app weekly answering members' questions. There's an exclusive podcast within the app that's run by Ryan, who is the prenatal dietitian that founded this entire thing. It's a wealth of knowledge and resources and will take you far beyond that one-page handout your doctor handed you that actually probably has out-of-date information about eating and pregnancy. So head on over to the prenatal nutrition library as soon as you get your big fat positive. Well, okay, first message me and Caitlin so we can do a happy dance with you. Then head over to the prenatal nutrition library to get clear strategies to meet your nutrient needs, as well as to take the stress out of confirming what's safe and most optimal for you and your baby while you're pregnant. Use code FFF20 for 20% off. So women that have block tubes are in conventional fertility care are sort of given this one road. And whether the tube is blocked or it doesn't seem to be working well, I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen besides just a straight up blocked tube. And uh, so this is sort of the road that they're offered. But you, in the model of care that you practice, you have other options. So let's start talking about like, what even are those options? And how do people know whether or not they should start looking into it? Yeah. So most women get a regular hysterosalpingogram. And so that's one of the main tests for tube. tube That's where they put the dye and take a peek and see if it's flowing and all of that. Typically, they're taken to a radiology suite. So there's x-ray above. Dye is injected in the cervix. And they see all or nothing is there spill through one or both tubes. And um, it can be pretty uncomfortable for some women, um, especially. I think it does help when the physician goes slower. So having someone very, you know, gentle and, and thoughtful with the process is important. So um, it's important to, to pick a good provider for that even. And um, and so they want to see just based on their eye, they eyeball these images to see if it's filling. And so um, they can see that there may be a, a blockage. So if there's no spill on one or both sides, it could mean there's a proximal tubal occlusion. And so Explain that, means, that. 
Yeah, it means where the tube inserts into the uterus, mm-hmm. there could be a blockage. So right, yeah, that connection between the, the I had tube that. and the uterus. Oh, yeah. I did, but we didn't do an HSG. We uh, knew that there was a polyp somewhere else oh. in my uterus. And so then my doctor went in to remove that polyp and saw another a big one just kind of squish and shut one of my tubes. Yep, that could that's that is one reason that would have, a tube would be blocked and and so another reason is a false pot, false spasm, so a false blockage because the tube spasms. Um, the uterus is a muscle and so that can happen. Um, so you can have false positive. Um, so you may want to consider a second one if if you have a block one or two blockages at the proximal side. So that means there's no spill. You just see the uterine cavity and there's no spill. Um, so another uh, possibility is a distal occlusion where uh, it's on the ovary have, end. Guess, yeah, more on the inside, internal, and usually that presents as a hydrocephalic, so the tube is filled with fluid. So that's usually found on ultrasound, not on HSG. Um, but what's interesting as far as testing, those aren't the HSG. A regular HSG is not the best test. It's the most common, but it's not. Oh, what's another yeah. test? <laughs> and so the best test for tube, tubal issues um, is called a selective hysterosalpingogram. And so it's similar to a hysterosalpingogram, but okay. much more accurate. And, um, and so it's where we put a catheter up into the inside, into that opening, that proximal tube. Inside, into the, the tube itself, not just tube. through. Okay, not, not just, just through the cervix. the cervix. Yeah, not just the okay. bottom. So I put a, this little plastic device up inside the tube. When you do that, do you say, start it from the bottom now here? Start it <laughs> from the bottom. <laughs> you sing, if you turn on a Drake song? No? I haven't okay. yet, but you know, I might. I might now. Now that Not you mention it. a lot of rapping going on in the, in the OR. I okay. mean, we, we listen to music, but I haven't usually picked a rap. That's not a usual go-to. But... Doesn't, doesn't aid the focus? Okay. Sorry. I'm interrupting with something dumb. It's I okay. just... Okay. Uh, go on, go on. I mean, we do all cheer. Shut up, Sophia. All right. When when we get tubes open, but um, <laughs> it's it's fun when we do that. But so we put the catheter up inside the tube. There's X ray and it's live, and so I see. I take a lot of action shots while I'm doing this, so I know where I'm putting it in the right place. I have a pressure gauge. Oh, I don't know. I have. I should get it. I have it somewhere. I can show you at the end. But um, yeah, if you're gonna watch this on YouTube, you can see a pressure gauge. Yeah, I can show it too. <laughs> I think it's in my office here, but so it's, it's, it measures. You just get one of those like tire. (laughs) (laughs) It's basically like that. It's a good analogy. So it all, um, it tells me in like millimeters of mercury, I turn it and uh, I want to watch the dye spill. So, but that's not enough. I look objectively at this measurement to make sure it's optimally open. I don't want to just use my eyeball and make sure it's spilling. I want to make sure there's not even a partial occlusion. Because we're talking about sperm cells getting in there, which are teeny yeah. in a singular egg, which is like so small. These are microscopic cells. So yeah. tiny. So, so tiny. This is not like a straw that you're going to be drinking a milkshake out of that just is like this huge our uterus and our tubes that's really little very very little very tiny surgery we're doing here yeah very so we want to stuff. optimize especially for natural yeah. fertility we want to get as many sperm up there as possible yeah so if there's a partial occlusion or complete occlusion i have a filmy a uh, flimsy guide wire that mm-hmm. i snake through kind of like snaking a sink Is that analogy it flimsy for makes it sound not good but it just means oh, it's just flexible. a little soft delicate wire yeah to go in through the tubes, uh, string it through a few times, and then put uh, put the catheter back in, turn the knob, and remeasure the pressure to make sure that it's gone down. So with this, you maybe we're sort of on a tangent here, but would these adhesions, blockages, partial blockages, yada, 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 would these contribute to ectopic pregnancy and tubal pregnancy? Yeah, so yeah, first I'll tell you the difference between the two different types of occlusions. A little more okay. to help you understand yeah. that. But yes, I do think this is related to one cause of ectopic pregnancy. Yes, a partial occlusion, most likely. And so if I do have a woman with a history of ectopic, we talk about this as an option for her. Um, 
depending on her whole history and, and what her wishes are and how aggressive she wants to be. But I do bring that up with women. And so you have the proximal blockage and you have a distal blockage. And, and so a proximal is more often just due to inflammation. I think women may be born with that or it may be something called salpingitis ismica nodosa. And that's that random r rare thing that I was looking up research for. Um, or you can have a distal blockage, so near the ovary. And so that's more often adhesions from the abdomen. The other one's ad adhesions from inside the tube. This is more external oh. adhesions. So, um, and so, so hydrosalpinx is often from scar tissue outside, like from PID on the outside, public inflammatory disease. So an old infection caused to like cause scar tissue to wrap around the tube or endometriosis causes scar tissue to wrap around the tube or have the tube tacked up somewhere and scarred. And so that will often present as hydrosalpinx and standard physicians that, that do IVF who aren't very trained in tubal surgery, which is an art that's lost. Um, they will say, well, you have to just remove the tube and do IVF, which, yeah, you know, there are other options. You can often correct the tube. It's not always possible, obviously. Um, but more often than not, the tissue, the endometriosis, the scar tissue can be taken down. That tube can be surgically corrected. Wow. And if we're not, if, you know, keeping your body parts is always the best choice in my yes. opinion. If it's possible to keep a body part, that is a good way to go because these body parts, they have function beyond what we understand. And, you know, just because you can live without your tonsils, without your adenoids, without your appendix, without your uterus, without your foot, you know, just because you can live without these things, it impacts your life. And I see that you know, there's been wonderful advancements in medicine, but sometimes we get a little bit ahead of ourselves. And if a body part can be spared, let's give it a go. That's, it, it's worth it. It's a worthwhile thing to try. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's data for IVF that if you take out the hydrosalpinx, there improve IVF outcome. But it doesn't compare to correcting the tube and success versus IVF. You know, that yeah. doesn't compare. But there is, for example, there is research comparing women who underwent bilateral tubal, you know, tubal ligation. So their tubes tied, sterilized, mm -hmm. sterilized. Yeah. By clips, for example. And these women regretted that and wanted to have more children. And they compared these two treatment arms of IVF versus tubal reversal. And it was much higher in the tubal reversal group. So that's the date that study is unique because that's hard to find natural yeah. conception versus IVF or natural conception time cycled versus IUI. They don't do that typically, but for that study that shows natural conception rates are going to be higher in the long run. Um, so if we're able to correct these tubes, the problem is that physicians don't even know it can be done. A lot of them, they don't even, yeah. they don't even know that these are correctable. They, and they, I even saw it an Instagram post by an IVF doctor that said, oh, you can't correct it. It'll come right back. The hydrosalpine. Oh, I know. I have seen that same kind of thing. I've had patients tell me like, well, my doctor told me that endometriosis excision surgery, like she's just going to have you coming in for surgery after surgery. If you want to be pregnant, I'll, I'm your doc. Like I'll do this. Red flag. Uh, or even like, yeah, red flag, right? Guarantee or, you pregnancy, that's a red flag. Yeah, or I can, yeah, I'll get you pregnant. I mean, I don't know how many times it'll, as, if you've got the money, I'll get you pregnant. Like I've even heard a doctor be like, yeah, we did, it took her 17 egg retrieval, 17 rounds of IVF before we oh got her there, gosh. but we got her there. A million dollars in. So a million dollars in heart and risk and yes. drugs and Understated. oh my god but so naomi when you're looking at a patient who you're going in and you're doing you go straight to this kind of more specialized hsg do you even start mm -hmm. with a normal hsg or is it more often that somebody's coming to you because they've done that 
and things aren't working and then you're coming in as a follow-up second opinion eighth opinion specialist you know a lot of times Sophia and I are the Hail Mary where um, it's very interesting because nutrition has a place no matter how you get pregnant, we it's see it as help. much more foundational <laughs> versus like the Hail Mary. Right. right. And um, I imagine you have a lot of instances too where people come, they haven't been aware of NAP NAPRO, they haven't um, been offered alternatives to a very conventional medical model that is kind of like its own, um, you know, it's just its own machine that you just get put in the beginning of it and get pushed out through like process after process and you only exit it when you get to your achieved goal. Um, so I'm wondering, it, like with that specific thing, do you start there? Are there other places you would start? Do people come with you knowing they have block tubes? I get it all, of course. I get a lot of failed therapies so so they've tried conventional things and which is mm -hmm. so, i hate using that word because like what if are you doing if not conventional i know i just whatever but um i'd say more common yeah, yeah more common treatments more mainstream treatments uh and do i always do selective hsg i would say more often i do selective hsg than not and regular hsg is the exception for me once you do it and but you know patients i like them to sleep for selective hsg so that's the downside you know anesthesia but honestly most patients are like yeah put me to sleep i had one it was miserable just put me to sleep and so we can do and that can be a sign in of itself like if the if the hsg because i've had patients that are like ain't nothing but a peanut like it was fine and they and what do you know they found no <laughs> problems in there but then the people that are like, there were adhesions, there were this, there were that, they were like screaming in pain. And it was mm -hmm. like this horrible traumatic incident was so extremely painful because the dye was pushing up against injured tissues. And just as we are trying to explore benefits, alternatives, risks, what are those things for this particular procedure? I mean, I would say mainly uh, anesthesia risk. And obviously I'd have to, it's, uh, you know, a very thorough discussion between the patient and, and the physician. But I mean, there, there, I guess technically there's a risk of uh, like perforation through the tube, but the, if you can late the tube, especially if there's an obstruction, it's a difficult tube to open. You could technically put a false channel through the tube, but it's about two millimeters. So it should heal. But so it's really uh, minimally risk. I had another question. And it just left my mind. I don't know what's wrong with me today. No, I, do I don't know, know why. I today. just my my like, thought my kids is woke I, me I up wish a million more. times last night. Oh, I'm sorry. I wish uh, more doctors just were able to do this. It's not that complicated to do. It takes some skill to learn, but it's only done by I assume around 40 people in the U.S. And this should be done. This should be oh, standard. Oh, I remembered my question. So another another risk would be like, isn't this? like you were just saying, it's more challenging for the physician. It's more time invested. It's maybe not as cost effective. It takes about 45 seconds, really, if, once you're really good at it. But, but the whole time. procedure of like having an anesthesia and getting oh, that, the yes, proper true. space and... Reimbursement, yeah. I don't think is very high. So the risk is for you, not the patient. Well, I mean, yeah, I think there's not much incentive for it if it's not reimbursed very well. I'm well, not sure, it, I don't know why. I, it's such a good procedure. I don't know why it's not more common, but I assume that has to do with reimbursement. Mm, mm -hmm, for example, mm -hmm. hysterectomy reimburses way better than a, uh, I mean, I don't know, I don't see this, the stats, but from what I understand, hysterectomy is more uh, lucrative than you know endometriosis excision. So that's part of the reason why that type of approach is more common lordy lordy hysterectomies again if we can keep your body parts <laughs> it is a good thing keeping your body parts keeping it intact when possible it's not always possible but when it's possible that's generally the better route to at well, least the problem, give it, I mean, give it try to times where the uterus is the problem it, but it's usually the scapegoat so that's a whole nother talk for another oh, yeah, day. I know. I remember that having a light bulb moment about that where I was like, I've had a few of those where I'm like, 
So the treatment for infertility that you're suggesting is to do a literal medical sterilization. What? What? Yeah. That is th crazy. <laughs> that does not sound right. Or the treatment for endometriosis, which is endometriosis was what defined by tissue growth outside of the uterus is to remove the uterus. What? Right. This does not make sense. I mean, I'm not a surgeon, but that shit don't make sense. <laughs> oh, there's so many stories. Oh, Naomi, oh. I'd like to bring us back to the question I asked earlier, where we talked a little bit about what NAPRO is. Mm. Um, and there, there are, there is a lot intertwined with it. I believe I don't do NAPRO, NAPRO or whatever we want to call it. Um, but uh, a lot of the decisions are, and offerings are not just what's possible, but it's, uh, value based, right? I mean, it's centered in good question. religion a little bit values. I mean, beliefs can you just speak your to own that personal a little bit? ethical there compass. might be people that have never heard of it and they might not know how these things are intertwined yeah it's a great question so you know why are we so different as napro doctors where did we come from well we are kind of countercultural um in that you know we came into this space for example i well first the science is what sold me at first when i was in medical school um i I saw two different approaches, the standard OBGYN care, and then I compared that to NAPRO next to each other. And um, I, I, I saw the heavy scientific foundation there that was treating disease and fixing underlying issues and healing these women to promote health and fertility. Um, and then I saw where that came from and it came from a, a deeper purpose to serve um, couples and, and come from this place of love for both the mom, the dad and, and the child. And so there's a respect there for all parties. And so with that respect, um, there's so many layers to it, but it includes, um, a love for children to have, um, parents and a love for that ch and respect for that child that begins in, in the womb. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's that, and that is driven from the faith perspective. And the reason NAPRO started is due to Dr. Hilders, um, at the time IVF was invented, he was taking care of patients, um, that were religious that didn't want to do IVF. And these women were charting their cycles and he saw on their charts, the, all these issues that were going on. And so he was able to use these women's. Data. Symptoms and track and data to identify and treat underlying issues and work with the body. And so that's, it just organically grew from this need. And so that's, and he used all the literature at that point and kept it going and kept adding more data. And there is research to support this. And it's very, you know, evidence-based. Um, it's just not commonly used. But um, so he's the one, that's where it came from. It came from a need that stemmed from re religious uh, patients and this physician who came from a faith perspective. And it ended up with this very scientific way, because you have to use science to make this work. Actually, it's much more challenging to put all the complexities of all these women's health issues and correct them. Um, and so you have to use all the data to, to compile that and constantly advance to ha have phenomenal outcomes. And that, that is what has happened. And, um, and in, in that, as a result, not only are we helping women get healthier, uh, but we're able to honor the, the d multiple dimensions that come with procreation, you know, as we get into NAPRO procreative technology in that um, we don't just view um, reproduction and or sex or intercourse as as separate from procreation there is both a unitive and procreative component of of sex uh, of a man and woman and so we don't want to separate those two things um, and so that is rooted in our faith and I think and that's what has motivated 
that helped form me and help form uh, my drive and my passion for this um, and helped me see just how incredible it is coming from that perspective. And so what's beautiful about keeping together the unitive and procreative is that you're really involving the husband in the process. For example, I saw an IUI happen you know, on my rotations and the husband was in another city and, you know, there was no unity there. And, and the doctor was like, well, now it's your job to get pregnant. You know, it was like, it was just him and this woman. Yeah, it and- can feel like it really reduces you to your body parts, sort of strips you of part of that. Yeah. Strips you of being a family, strips you of being a couple. Sometimes you feel like it even strips you of your humanity in some ways yeah. and sort of makes you feel like you are, you are ovaries in a uterus and he is a penis and testicles. And that's right. pretty much how you feel. And so there's a whole beautiful description by JP2 of Theology of the Body that goes into this and can say it way better than I can. But, you know, keeping that unity and procreation together is what is just so beautiful because that's how God designed us. And so, um, you know, cutting off and tubes for your mental health at the same time and the health of your family. And that's that's a piece that people get so can get so lost in this is like you be like you said the tunnel vision on a baby that you forget that we're not just trying to have a baby we're trying to have a family here we're trying to have it's in that i see as the piece that people grieve so heavily when it comes to needing reproductive health is caitlin has said this so many times like all of our dream was that we were just going to fall in love and get married and have all this hot sex and fall (laughs) pregnant because we were just so in love and so passionate with our husband that you know and now this beautiful baby is the result of our love for each other and when you have to put more effort and timing and medicine or you know whatever treatments into this that dream gets shattered and you don't feel like it's it's just it wasn't what you wanted and so to think of it as this family is being built it's not just a uterus And a testicle makes a baby, and then there we go. Like, everyone is – you're more than the sum of your parts. You're To Mm -hmm. to be treated as humans, as family, it it can be so healing because needing help in the first place often shatters the dream that you had. Well, and Mm -hmm. family and relationships are a huge part of creation and why man exists to be children of God and to love and honor yeah. him and mm-hmm. being designed in his image. I think that we barely scratch at understanding some of these things, but building a family has only drawn me closer to my heavenly father and my ability to understand his love for me Same. and his purpose for me. Um, and that is very often like, removed from the equation of a very long fertility journey and a difficult thing to continue pursuing for some people that that is important to you. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that at least I've seen in couples that I've treated that are choosing a NAPRO physician um, and, or even just a NAPRO practitioner that can help them understand and grow in their understanding of what their bodies do and how to optimize things and how to use this data to interpret what may be going on is an inner connection and a reminder of that process and that goal, which is something that Sophia and I do when we have open doors to do that with people. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that is a helpful piece because again, even as a doctor or as a dietitian or as somebody pursuing growing a family, it's really hard to do just about anything without trying to do it with God. <laughs> like you're going to bang your head up against a wall a lot harder yeah. than if you realize our weakness, his strength is perfected in it. And he, he searches the earth looking for those whose heart is towards him so that he can show himself strong on their behalf. And, um, it's it's nice to know that there not is just skill and science behind what you do, Dr. Naomi, and what others like you do, but that there's also a reverence for 
how we've been created in God's image and can continue being image bearers of God as we grow families. I, I see this in patients that I've worked with that are also working with NAPRO doctors. The, a main difference that I hear and that I have personally seen is mo- a reverence for life just in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, not saying that a traditional fertility doctor, reproductive endocrinologist doesn't reverence life. That's not true. But a different reverence for life where your baby is looked at as a person from the very start. And so things like pregnancy loss, things like eptopic pregnancies, it's just treated differently with a with a different respect for human life, a different sort of opening up for you to have a, an experience of like your <sighs> It's a difference between like your baby, well, I guess it wasn't meant to be. I sort of see that in the medical model. Whereas with a NAPRO doctor, your baby did be. This was your baby. And your baby happened to complete their life within your body. And and that was your baby's whole life versus your baby didn't have a life. It wasn't real or something. I don't, I've never heard a reproductive endocrinologist say your baby wasn't real, but just the, the culture there, the mood there, the way that things are handled in NAPRO versus conventional or mainstream, it just seems to be just, I don't know. There's like a, there's like a sort of a, a layer to it. I want to call it a magic, an essence, an energy, a vibe, like whatever it is that like, we're doing this because human life has inherent value and this baby is a person and a part of you and a part of your family. And that did happen. That does happen. That's what we're doing is we're building a part of your family and um, just looking at things through that lens. It's sort of, it seems to just change the, like a different seasoning on all the interactions that people have while working with this, with this type of doctor. That was one of my pivotal moments in deciding whether I should do NAPRO or OBGYN at all. Uh, was when I was on my OBGYN rotation as a very early med student. And I walked, I was in a room with a patient who was told you miscarried and she started crying and we walked outside the room and the resident physician said, well, why is she crying? She was only 11 weeks and, you know, she was non-compliant with blah, blah, blah medication. You know, that hit me hard to see that. Yeah. That like that was her comment. baby, bro. Yeah. Like, geez, was... have and a I heart. Just, I wanted to do better than that. That was a big moment for me. Hey guys, we're taking a break from our episode and I want to talk about something that's super confusing. When you head down the supplement aisle and you're looking for a prenatal and on the prenatal bottle itself, it says, do not take if you're trying to conceive pregnant or breastfeeding. Like what the heck? Talk to your doctor if you are pregnant, could be pregnant, breastfeeding, postpartum, whatever. And every supplement has this. You go down the supplement aisle, you go shopping on whatever supplement website, and there's a disclaimer on every bottle of every single thing, which means that everything that you've been taking your whole life long is now a big question mark about whether or not you are potentially harming yourself by taking something where you're trying to be healthy. So that is why we partnered with Needed. Needed is a perinatal nutrition supplement brand that has a wide array of products specifically designed for women who are pregnant, trying to become pregnant, breastfeeding, or postpartum. So it's not just that these products like can work if you're in that situation or, oh, it's probably okay if you take it while you're trying to conceive. No, no. These products are researched, they are formulated, and they are put together specifically for women who are trying to conceive, pregnant, breastfeeding, and postpartum. This answers so many questions. I always get asked, like, what can I take? It's cold and flu season. What's safe? Needed has an immune support. That's safe whether you're trying to conceive, pregnant. It's even safe for your little ones. And it's not just immune support. They've got collagen. They've got hydration support. They have digestive support. They have prenatal multi. They even made a line for dudes. Needed is somebody we're really proud to be partnering with. So head over to their website and use code FFF20 for 20% off your order. 
If I only had a heart. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah. That's what that makes me think of. And, you know, it's it's so easy to judge doctors and stuff like that. It's just so easy to th- the lob those sort of things at them. But, like, I... I see this, you know, in my own life, my husband, uh, in his military career, there are things he's seen and things he's done and, and things he still deals with, where his reaction to things that would like horrify or sadden Mm -hmm. a normal, I don't want to say normal person, but like (laughs) someone who hasn't been traumatized by the horrors of war, he just is had in order to cope has sort of come up with a worldview that you know, isn't as painful for him. And so it's a coping mechanism. I mean, we do see many miscarriages. It is hard. It is hard to experience it with patients over and over. But I think we're going to have you back to talk about (laughs) treatments for that. But we should probably grab the wheel and come back to this tube topic because we haven't really given our listeners. So we have the um, flexible tube, the flimsy wire, whatever you call it, treatment. We have the different way of looking at the tubes. Uh, is there anything else that you would want to add to that of treatments? Because I think we could also get into what are some of the problems that you see? What are some things that people might be experiencing that uh, their doctor maybe didn't look for, or didn't know about, or has never even heard of? So, um, but before we do that, let's stick to treatments. What are some other treatments that are out there? So yeah, the we talked about the cannulation. So one or both tubes may need to be open from that proximal tube with the selective HSG. Or you can have distal blockage. So near where the, uh, the tube and the ovary are in the abdomen. And so sometimes I find a normal HSG and they have a lot of disease in their abdomen and they had a normal HSG, but there's scar tissue around their tube or the end of their tube um, is compromised from endometriosis, for example. And so really a diagnostic laparoscopy in that case for women who, let's say, have, you know, continued to have issues after many failed treatments and um, they, or they have severe pain or they have abnormalities on ultrasound like complex cysts that suggest endometriosis. And so you know, if they've been, had many years of infertility and failed multiple treatments, we'll do a laparoscopy. So looking in the belly for things like scar tissue and endometriosis being the most common. And, um, you know, especially if they also had a, to, had, um, a history of pelvic infection, pelvic inflammatory disease, you know, we may be have an increased suspicion of adhesions in the pelvis. But I've seen women with a belly full of adhesion, adhesions. I had one, and uh, we think maybe her appendix had ruptured when she was a teenager. So we didn't Dear even know Lord. where that came from. We're not sure what happened, but her appendix auto amputated, and it was in two parts and had healed. And then she had scar tissue all over her pelvis. So that was our theory as to why. <laughs> her, Just her imagining tooth. her going through that and her doctor being like, "Take an Advil." Yes. Well, it's her mom was an is a nurse, and that's what happened. Her mom was probably like. You're fine. Go to school. Okay. But, anyway, go on. <laughs> yeah. So you could have, um, most common would be just scar tissue around the tubes. You can clean up the tubes. Uh, but sometimes the end of the tubes are, the fimbria are encased in adhesions. And so you need to peel the adhesions back. You could do something called a fimbrioplasty where you kind of reconstruct the end of the tube. And so there are many different surgeries to do on tubes themselves. It's a, it's an art. It's a skill that not many physicians are trained in. So there's really no specialty that's trained in tubal surgery anymore, except NAPRO, which there's not that many of us. So um, I find that challenge you, because I'm constantly sending people to you guys and they're like can, going all over the country to try to find some help. So even MIGs, minimally invasive gyne surgeons who do these great excision surgeries, if they see endo on a tube, they I don't think a lot of them are trained on how to preserve the tube. So I've seen... Yeah. When I've seen MIGS doctors remove the entire tube for a possible small lesion of endometriosis instead of just cutting it out and preserving the tube. Can you talk a little bit about the fimbria? Like what what type of movement or like how is optimal tissue working where an adhesion might stop it from doing its job? Yeah, uh, the fimbria are my favorite. They look like coral and they're at the end of the tube. And... 
they kind of move. If you look at them underwater, they kind of move like coral. And so what or happens? Like a jellyfish. If, if you're not watching us on YouTube, Naomi's yeah. doing this like thing with her finger, moves. like or like an well, with octopus. The waves, yeah, with the waves they move. With okay. The waves. But probably what well what I've read is that um, there's chemoattractants on the end of the fimbria and on the egg, and so there's like a positive and negative charge that attracts oh, yeah. each other. Oh yeah. Okay. And it's a muscular organ, so I do believe that side it moves. And then when intercourse happens in the fertile window, the sperm go up through the uterus and contractions happen, especially with the release of oxytocin. And the sperm will be, the uterus will contract upwards from the cervix up to the tube. And the sperm favor the side, the tube where the corpus luteum is. Go out that side and have. Yeah, I, I saw you that. made a, you made a post about that a couple of days ago. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. You. Yeah, I just learned it myself. I was like, it was mind blowing. I, I just, I was doing, you know, Corpus I just know. Sodium is my life, and I just learned yes. it myself. I was just thinking, I think about the uterus and all these different parts of conception. Since I'm staring at all these pelvises and looking at these fimbria, I'm like, I just know oxytocin and orgasm have a purpose in natural conception, and I know natural conception is better than IUI statistically, and I know that's part of it. So I yeah. just wanted to look at data for that because there's a purpose be behind every little aspect of our body, like cervical mucus filtering the sperm. And somehow the body attracts it to the corpus luteum side. It may be those chemo attractants. Maybe there's something in the sperm. I'm not sure. But it's definitely in the fimbria, like a positive charge connecting to the egg. And so it'll stretch out and capture the egg and um it can do it from either side so you can technically get pregnant if you have one tube and you ovulate from the other side yeah i've seen that happen i've seen women have that happen yeah well before we move on to any other questions we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsor we're taking a break to talk about our sponsor fertility cloud in working with hundreds of you ladies, we have noticed a problem that has come up. I know it's come up for me, Caitlin. It's come up for your clients as well. And that is not only finding a doctor who is going to know how to help you, but one that wants to. <laughs> we have a lot of issues here. And sometimes getting a simple blood test or actually getting a medication or, or talking to someone who's actually an expert infertility can not only take an insane amount of time, but it can feel like you're fighting your doctor. Yeah, or you're playing like Russian roulette to get in front of somebody who actually cares. We are so excited to be partnering with Fertility Cloud because they have a solution for all of these frustrations. Just last week, I had a client that needed right now care, and we couldn't get her in front of an OB. And she got a same day appointment with Fertility Cloud and spoke to a reproductive endocrinologist and had a prescription that she needed in her hand hours later. This is a solution that our industry desperately needs, and we are so excited to present to you. So if you're in a remote area and you have to drive four hours to go see a doctor, or if you've been to multiple doctors and none of them seem to really listen or really care or want to take an approach that works for you, start up with My Fertility Cloud. My Fertility Cloud has provided us a link, so check it out in the show notes that will get you $25 off your first visit with one of their providers. Guys, I am so excited to tell you that the PCOS app is sponsoring this podcast episode. The PCOS app is a one-stop shop for all things PCOS. It's also your meal guide and inspo all in one. If you love listening to me on this podcast and you feel like, hey, I want Caitlin to be in my ear every day encouraging me about how to manage my PCOS, then you have to go download the PCOS app. We have curated articles to answer questions that you have about PCOS. There are short snippets in the PCOS Answers podcast exclusive to the PCOS app. We also have recipes where I not only give you the recipe, but teach you within the recipe itself what I have done to make it more blood sugar and hormone supporting so that you can take your own recipes and make them more PCOS friendly. If you've been looking for the Google of all things PCOS, with the filter of compassion and expertise that you get from Caitlin Johnson RD, then you have found it in the PCOS app. Head to your Android or Apple store today, download it, and let's hang out. So Naomi, um, something that I've seen people 
have happened to them that has been a worry is when they're going in for any sort of anesthesia based tube involvement treatment. Um, I unfortunately know stories of patients that have had either tubes removed or ovaries removed and it, they didn't consent to it. The doctor just said, well, the you know abnormal tissue growth was there and so we needed to remove it and they walk away from this surgery sterilized or partially sterilized without their consent. Um, so I, I think that's a very common concern when we're talking about two base treatments. So can you sort of speak to that for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I get messages and women send me these heartbreaking stories. You know, my tubes were removed and I didn't know it going in. I think it's important to talk to your doctor and feel very comfortable with your physician, talk to them about different scenarios. You know, do they do tubal corrective surgeries or what happens in different scenarios? You know, asking a lot of questions. Are they resp responsive to questions? Are they open to your questions? That's a good sign. Um, you know, are they skilled and able to do that? What do they do in different scenarios like a hydrosalpinx or, you know, endometrioma? So if there's a ball of endometriosis in the ovary, are they able to remove it all? Do they close the ovary? You know, different techniques. Um, you can ask just different scenarios. Um, I do have a course that I made for this purpose because I can't, unfortunately, help everyone yeah, in everywhere. every scenario. Mm -hmm. But I can educate on different surgical uh, concepts, techniques, and data. I give that in my course. That's to help empower um, patients with this type of surgical knowledge so they can know a lot of information, stuff that's not taught in OBGYN residency, actually, even. So not in med school, not even in my regular OBGYN training, but to be able to ask them, what's your scar tissue prevention strategy? You know, really being very, don't just go to the surgeon that's next door to you with the next opening. You want to go around, do your research, talk to them, take notes, bring questions, and compare. And that should help empower you with the knowledge to help pick someone that's skilled and respectful, um, you know, asking questions as to how are they going to respect your fertility? Um, you know, some physicians are much more predis you know, prone to just remove organs than correct them. Um, it is quicker that way, uh, but it's important that they talk to you about the risk benefits alternatives. So, you know, if you have a tube issue, are they going to talk to you about alternative treatments or are they going to say, no, you just have to remove it? I would say that's a red flag. Um, so really doing your research and getting multiple opinions. Uh, my husband just had back surgery. I did the same thing. I had to go on the other end and become a patient. I saw, I don't know, three or four different surgeons before we found the one. I'd be willing to see more, but we finally, we found someone that, that we really, I passed the test, um, but Ooh, we'll have to talk about this afterwards. My <laughs> my husband's getting treatment for back pain. It's part of why I'm like brain dead today is because he's been absolutely bedridden for the past day and I've had to do everything for him and the kids. That's but been our last yeah. 10 years and it's related oh to his military service as well. Yeah, so. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for shedding some light on that before we go down the rabbit hole of our broken husbands. Um <laughs> All three of us listeners have veteran husbands, so this is what we talk about. But uh, okay, well, we are going to have to wrap this episode up. Um, we are so thankful that you came on here, Naomi. You are a, just a gem, and you are giving our listeners so much and even showing them that there are alternatives not even saying that you have to choose this or that right. the path that you did chose isn't right for you, but informed consent knowing mm -hmm. what your options are before you mm -hmm. make a choice so that you can be sure that you're making the choice that's right for you so listeners i hope that for those of you that have made choices that this is affirming to you i hope for those of you that are looking down the barrel of some choices that you now understand a more complete picture of what's possible uh, and I hope that this was really educational and encouraging to you. That's really what we want from each episode. So on the note of encouragement and positivity, we're going to do our yeah, girl. So who wants to go first? Caitlin, do you got a yeah, girl for us today? I do. I don't want to go Let's first hear. though. Oh, no. she doesn't want to go first. Someone else. Someone else go first. Okay. Uh, Naomi, do you have one? 
I feel and like so I'm just many right now. I, blabbing. I'm so so I, don't my... I, I'll, I can just keep talking, and then you guys can decide if you want. My brother... I can come up with the Jaeger. Okay, let's hear yours. Yeah. Well, my husband's doing amazing after his surgery, and so oh, it's that's a huge Jaeger. That's huge. what I want to hear. Miraculous surgery. Did he have a, like recovery. a lumbar fusion? What did he have? No, he had a disc replacement. Ooh. Holy it's the macro. napro of spine surgery. It's the napro with spine surgery. Okay, we don't need to go into that. Can't we can talk but... separately, but cool. Yeah. So, Amazing. so yeah, girl. Just... Yeah, yeah, hey, girl. Girl. yeah. My man. <laughs> my man. That's what we do. <laughs> what we do. <laughs> it's a dude. My man. My All man. right. That's great. To have a partner that's not in pain and able to function in the family, hot diggity. Mm-hmm. I've had one day of it, of him being like really bedridden and... I, it was getting real old after a couple hours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I tell you that. Oh, good. Well, yeah, girl, to that, and good on you for for interviewing these surgeons and for finding somebody that was going to do the good, the good, good for your family. Okay, His Caitlin, last name did you? Is good. Oh, Doctor Good. Yeah, Mister Goodbar. That's pretty awesome. Okay, I have one. It's not really so much. Yeah, girl is just. Well, maybe it is. Um, backstory, Anything's I, a yeah, girl. I hate cats. Like, I really <laughs> effing hate cats. I hate them so much. Don't hate me if you're a cat person. But I, like, really don't like them. And when we moved here, we had a nanny who had, like, four or five cats. And she would take the girls to her house sometimes because they love the cats. And then they'd come home and say, Mommy, can we have a cat? And I would say no. And they would say why. And I would say, well, because POTUS, our dog, the President of the United States, doesn't um, like cats and so a presidential we, decree against cats a cat and, embargo um and so then this question from my three-year-old started being um when potus dies can we get a cat well we'll talk about it then then the question was when is potus gonna die and the yeah girl here is not that my dog died but that i went to a family reunion recently on a farm and they had barn cats and my three children followed them all day long and petted them and held them and these were grown cats and anyway I just had this kind of like moment where I was like oh, we need to get a cat and we just moved into a new house with a lot of property and there are bunny rabbits around and I'm sure there's mice somewhere and I was like we need my children will love having a cat and I will not have a cat in my house I will not you don't want to live with a box of turds what a weirdo. Or like something that walks <laughs> in a box of turds and then walks on my counter. No, thank you. Yeah, and that their pee is like the most toxic stink that's ever <laughs> occurred. So anyway, we're at this family reunion. I look at this homesteading aunt of my husband's and I'm like, hey, do you have cats? She's like, yeah, we got a few barn cats. And I was like, what does it take to have an outside cat? She's like, you f- leave them food and water. And most of the time you, they don't even need food because they kill all the things around your house. And I was like, can I have a cat that I never have to touch, that I put their food and water outside so nothing, even my garage won't get smelly and yada, yada. She's like, yeah, and this is how you can do it. And my barn cat just had kittens. And so they are this week weaning and I will have a couple cats in a few weeks. I'd be happy to give you as many as you want. She had four. So we got two kittens, mostly because... Sharing is an important life skill that I don't want to teach through kittens. Yeah. So my through a through a, a living being. Right. So my two daughters, oh, both have their own kitten. Fiona named hers Pickles. Bonnie so named cute. hers Pickles cat. Ah, so His fun. Name is I thought that her name is Pickles here, oh. and then Bonnie's little kitten her name is mittens because she has little white mittens on all her paws so cute too and i still hate cats these little kittens are pretty cute i don't enjoy holding them or taking care of them and um it's actually been a really great lesson in like responsibility go feed your cat go put water out you want to play with your cat right now they are living in our garage until they're a little bit bigger because we have huge birds around us um so anyway, it's just been really fun. Our like outside time has quadrupled with very little supervision because they just lay in the front courtyard holding their cats and From carrying what I've toys seen in around. The pictures, I don't think these cats' feet have touched the ground since you've gotten them. They They've been being held loved and carried every second. Very hard. It's a little painful if you like, um, you know, anything to be comfortable in life. These kittens have not had a comfortable couple weeks in our household. 
because I have a 20 month old who squeezes them and goes, oh, and the girls will like pick it up by a random body part, but they're very resilient. I found, um, and I've just like, I guess the yeah girl in this is just my girls. This is the summer of kittens and they are so excited. And, uh, Bonnie said to my husband the other day, come outside so you can meet your um, nephew since you're its uncle. And I was like, Bonnie, honey, first of all, you don't understand this like family hierarchy. Daddy is not this cat's uncle. Okay, Seamus is the cat's uncle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's trying to like bulge an eye out every time. But anyway, they're really cute. Come see my baby. They're my Aww. children are really cute with the cats and quite so you, literally uh, harming them with love. Oh, God. <laughs> well, yeah, girl, yeah. to your cats. It's just been a sweet, uh, fun summer with them so far. Oh, my gosh. Well, oh, crap, it's my turn. I don't know. What's my yeah, girl? My yeah, girl is that I turned 36 on Monday. Gonna, I'm having my birthday. birthday. Yeah, I can't believe it. 36 years old. What the hell? When did that happen? Crazy. And this is my natural hair color with no dye. Can you believe it? 36 years. Way to go, and you. And only several hundred grays. You um, can't tell through this hidden. hidden. <laughs> <laughs> it's the way I part my hair. No, um... Yeah, so I'm getting I guess more that's myself. my yeah, girl. Is yeah, that girl. I'm uh, I'm having a birthday, and I'm going on my actual birthday. I'm going up to Pacific Palisades to meet up with a bunch of other practitioners to spend a couple days uh, together, learning from each other and what great networking. Timing. Oh yeah, I'm so, fun. so excited and pumped, and. My little brother Bennett, he's uh, coming around the mountain. He's coming down here on Sunday, day before my birthday, and he's going to install some storage in our garage. Oh, I'm so excited for that to get some like overhead that's the storage. Girl. Yeah, Lord. that's the Yagro. It's not installed yet, so maybe next recording can be a, my Yagro about the garage storage. But I just <laughs> bought all the stuff from Costco. When you're like, and... Yeah, girl is my new vacuum or my floor cleaner or Dude, my new I know. storage. Like you're in a different era that of your life. That floor cleaner I got is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> let me tell you, and actually, probably literally because it was very expensive. But with my eight month old eating. Eating, I'm using quotes for those of you who are listening, aka tasting and flinging. And we do baby led weaning here. And so we just like give her food and let her taste it herself. And she is just such a flinger. Somehow it always ends up on her right shoulder. I don't know what she's doing. She's like wiping her hand on her shoulder or something. But it's always like she's got a, some food perched up here like a pirate with his parrot. And, Saving uh, it for later so she can do a little guess. head turn. But like cleaning the floor after her is a breeze with my floor cleaner. So it's <laughs> so wonderful. I'm so happy to have that. But that's my yeah girl. Birthday coming up. Overhead storage. In Y'all, my garage. this has been another fun episode of Food Freedom and Fertility. We are praying for you. Did you know we pray for you? We, we do. are praying for your family to grow. We are here to bring on expert guests like Naomi. And we want other people to find us. So do us a big solid. Tell Sophia and I what you love about the podcast, what we can do to serve you more by leaving a rating and review. Rating is like, hey, this many stars. Review is words of love and thankfulness. And subscribe and so subscribe. that you never miss an episode. And share Thanks it with for a listening. Friend. Bye. Hey, it's Sophia. If you love the show and want to continue your health and fertility journey using our resources, head on over to foodfreedomfertility.com for show notes, links to products and services, information about our guests, and our newsletter. Again, that's foodfreedomfertility.com. Thanks for listening.